Now blood flow, so this equation you probably remember from your MCAT. You know, for the sake of step one, you definitely don't have to integrate it as frequently. Okay, so I'm just gonna go on for about 30 seconds about where this equation comes from. And then we'll just go through the most high yield thing down. But the idea here is if you remember back from your circuits, right? So voltage is equal to current times resistance, okay? It's like Ohm's law, but it's the same concept as that. See, the, the current is really just the flow. So it's the blood flow times the resistance, which is equal to the pressure gradient, okay? So it's essentially the pressure gradient is your voltage, the flow is your current, resistance is resistance, okay? Because a circuit is basically like a bunch of pipes, which are your blood vessels, okay? So this is the general concept. So if I, the idea here is if I have a bigger pressure gradient, if at one side of, a, you know, if I have a tube here, if at one side of the tube, the pressure is really, really high, but at the other side of the tube, the pressure is pretty low, right? Blood flow is going to go towards the side of lower pressure, okay? So there's going to be a, fat, a higher flow if there's a, a bigger gradient. If there's more resistance in this vessel, for example, if I have a really tiny vessel versus a really big vessel, right? The really tiny vessel is going to have a higher resistance. And so the resistance is primarily going to be associated with the radius, but it's inversely proportional. See, as I decrease the radius here, my resistance went up. Whereas if I have a really big vessel, there's a lot more room for flow for laminar flow, okay? So that's the idea. So the first thing is, the highest yield thing here is that the radius is going to be the primary determinant of flow and resistance. The radius is proportional to flow. Higher radius, more flow, okay? Lower radius, less flow, all right? That's the first thing. And it's because it's to the fourth power. So if I double the radius of my blood vessel, I'm gonna get 16 times the amount of flow. Okay, that's a pretty big change, right? Because it'll be two to the fourth power. If I double the radius, I'm gonna get 16 times as much flow. Okay, so that is the number one most important thing. So that's the first concept. So again, if they tell you that, you know, you have a resistance of, let's say, 32. Okay, I'm, I don't know what the units are. Let's just say 32. And they say that, okay, you double your radius. So let's say you double the radius, right? So then it's gonna go up by a factor of two. Two to the fourth power is 16. Okay, and the radi and the resistance is inversely proportional to the radius, right? 32 divided by 16. So the resistance would go down to two. So again, the big point is that the radius is proportional to flow and inversely proportional to resistance. Okay, and again, by doubling the radius, you're changing the flow going up by a factor of 16 and the resistance going down by a factor of 16. Okay, so that's the thing to remember. Now let's go through the second highest yield thing that I wanna talk about here. Second highest yield thing, and to do that, we're gonna to have to skip the equation for a second. Capillaries have the greatest total cross-sectional area. Okay, so this is very confusing for people. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you get a board question and they ask you, which of the following has the greatest total cross-sectional area? And they give you capillaries and they give you arterioles and they give you the aorta. And a lot of people, especially the first time they get this question, they're going to pick the aorta right? Because, you know, you're thinking about it, you're like, okay, here's my aorta, right? It's got this massive lumen. And then I'm thinking about capillaries. They're really tiny. How could it possibly be that the capillaries have a greater, greater total cross-sectional area than the aorta, right? The aorta is a massive blood vessel. The reason for that is because you have to watch the wording here. They're asking for the total cross-sectional area, the total cross-sectional area, right? So that's all of the area of all of the capillaries because there's so many capillaries, right? So if you think about your blood vessels, right? So you start off with your aorta, okay? So you have your aorta, and then you're gonna have blood vessels branching off, right? And as you have your abdominal aorta, right? You have all these blood vessels branching off as the aorta continues down here, right? And eventually you have your iliac arteries, okay? And as these vessels branch, there's gonna be additional branches and additional branches and additional branches, right, that are constantly coming off. And eventually, you're gonna to get to the branches of the branches of the branches of the branches, which are the capillaries, okay? And there's so many more capillaries. If you add up the total cross-sectional area of all of the capillaries coming off all of these vessels, it's gonna be a lot more area than this one single aorta here, okay? So the capillaries in general have the greatest total cross-sectional area, if we add them up all together, because there's so many of them, the total cross-sectional area is so large. So if I increase the cross-sectional area, 
I'm gonna have a lower blood velocity. Okay, so this is a concept where you can go back to equations and make sense of it, or you can just kind of remember that the capillaries are gonna have the greatest total cross-sectional area and the lowest blood velocity. And quite honestly, that's really the way I would remember it. But the trick is, you know, if you understand the reverse of this, it's actually a little bit easier. Because remember, the aorta is gonna have a very fast blood velocity because the pressures are so high. Okay, so the aorta is gonna be the opposite of this. So the aorta is going to have a low total cross-sectional area, even though when you think about it, it's tricky because the aorta, when you when you see an image of it, you might think, okay, yeah, that, that lumen looks pretty big, but it's actually gonna have a low total cross-sectional area because there's only one aorta. But because the total cross-sectional area is so low and you have the same pressure going through the aorta as you do all of these capillaries, the blood velocity is actually gonna be much higher. So when we're talking about resistance, Remember, this is a big fact. We've kind of already talked about this. Arterial is the primary regulator of total peripheral resistance. Okay, going back to your physics. I know we all love circuits, but um, this is still comes up on step one. So in series circuits, you know, is basically when you have, I'm just gonna draw an example here. When you have a bunch of resistors kind of in a row, you know, just for an example, let's say this is my aorta, and then I have my brachiocephalic artery here. So this is gonna be going to the right side. And then I have my right subclavian artery. Okay, and so what I'm doing here is I'm just showing you vessel after vessel after vessel, right? And this might eventually, you might go to your axillary artery, etc. Okay, and so this is just kind of going, we're going to the next artery, to the next artery, and eventually we're going to get to some distal artery probably in the hand, okay? As we continue going down this pathway from the aorta, from the brachiocephalic artery, to the right subclavian artery, to the axillary artery, okay? And so as we're going through each one of these, right, that's gonna be in series. So everything is going in series. So the resistance, the total resistance, is going to be the resistance from the aorta, the resistance from the brachiocephalic artery, the resistance from the subclavian artery, the resistance from the axillary, axillary artery all the way down, and that will provide us with a total resistance that the blood has to travel through. So there'll be a pressure gradient and a resistance that is gonna be dependent on all the vessels that we have to go through in series. Okay, so the concept is, again, if you go from your aorta to your arteries, to your arterioles, all the way down to the capillaries, as you're doing that, you're going in series. You're going in one kind of unit. Whereas in parallel, for example, might be, okay, well, here's your brachiocephalic artery, here's your left common carotid artery, here's your left subclavian artery, you know, here's your celiac trunk, here's your superior mesenteric artery. So in other words, all these vessels are kind of branching off at different points. We're not going in series, they're just all branching off of this one vessel at different places. So to figure out the resistance in this situation, between each of these vessels, we would have to uh, write this equation in parallel, which is one divided by the total resistance, which would be equal to one over the resistance of each of these vessels. That would give us the total resistance amongst all these vessels. Okay, and again, just remember, and usually you don't have to do a lot of plugging in with this equation, but just remember, this gets confusing. A lot of times people write this equation like this. They'll put total resistance, is equal to one over R1 plus one over R2, and they'll just kind of go on and do that. Remember, that's not correct. To do this correctly, the total resistance is gonna be, it's gonna be one over the total resistance. So for example, if you had, you know, one fourth plus one half is equal to one over RT. This is just an example, right? One fourth plus one half is really just three fourths is equal to one over RT. So then RT would be equal to four over three. So this is why it gets kind of tricky. So just always remember that this is one over the total resistance. Okay, now this is the money point to remember. In series, the blood flow is going to be constant through each resistor. Okay, so the blood flow through the arteries, through the arterioles, through the capillaries, it's gonna be constant. The blood flow through the aorta, through the brachiocephalic artery, through the subclavian artery, through the axillary artery, it's gonna be constant, okay? So that's the big thing to remember for series. In other words, as this blood is flowing, right, it's not going to change its flow rate between each one of these vessels. It's just going to flow from one vessel to another based on their pressure gradient and their resistance. Now, when we're talking about vessels in parallel, for example, you know, again, let's just say that we have some vessel here and every vessel that branches off of this single vessel, right, if this was our aorta, for example, these vessels will all have the same pressure. Okay, so all the vessels in parallel will have the same pressure. Okay, so that's, remember the P in parallel, P in pressure. So they're all gonna have the same pressure. So the pressure is constant in parallel. So again, the flow is constant, 
in series, the pressure is constant and parallel. It kind of makes sense. I like thinking of things in series, right? Because if I have you know, my aorta going all the way down to my veins, I know that the pressure in the aorta is not going to be the same pressure in a single vein. For example, if I follow that blood all the way down its path and its trajectory, I know that the pressure is going to change through each single you know, substituent of vessel that I go through. As I go through the aorta, through the brachiocephalic artery, eventually to a capillary, eventually to a vein. If I'm just sitting on a blood, on a blood cell following it all the way through, the pressure is going to change throughout my route. Whereas if I look at these blood vessels that are branching off in parallel, they're all going to have the same pressure. Okay, there's no reason why one would have a different pressure because they're all originating from that single same structure. The pressure is gonna be constant, but however, the flow could be different depending on at what point that vessel originates. Now, the last two things I want you to remember in this flow equation is that the, again, we have the change in pressure in the numerator here. And all, I'm, all I really did to create this equation, I took this Q and isolated it, right? So I just divided pressure by resistance. So I just have Q is equal to change in pressure divided by resistance, okay? And so this is the change in pressure right here. The resistance, which I just showed you what it's proportional to, is just plugged into this equation here. And that's where you get this from. It's because it's just the change in pressure and the resistance is on the bottom. So all I'm doing is I'm taking, I'm flipping this. So I get R to the fourth in the numerator and then I get the viscosity and the length in the uh, denominator. Now, N again is viscosity, okay? And we think I wrote it here. Viscosity is how thick the blood is essentially. So in board questions, there's a couple things this is gonna be related to. Usually it's gonna be a patient that has polycythemia or a patient that has anemia. And they might be saying, well, how does the polycythemia affect the flow? Remember, polycythemia would be higher hematocrit, higher viscosity, lower flow. If a patient has anemia, they might have a higher flow, okay, because the hematocrit might be lower. Think of it as like the thickness of the blood. If blood's really thick, it's not gonna flow as easily. And if a, also, if a vessel is longer, if I have a, a cylinder that's longer, there's more opportunities for that blood flow to encounter resistance, okay? So length is gonna be proportional to resistance. Longer blood vessel, more opportunity to encounter resistance.